Alright, so today we're going to talk about lights and what lights add to your uh, scene. So this is the rendering I did in this class, you kind of you've seen it before, but everything is kind of flat, right? You can't really see anything. Up there, there's nothing. You can kind of see a little of the brick back in here. You can see kind of the floor there. That's just with the default lights. You can barely see the door. Yeah, you can barely see anything. So by just adding some lights, I think that's four lights, you get that. Nothing changed except for the lights. I did, I did it with the lights on, I just turned off all the lights and I got this. <laughs> so just by adding lights, you can see a lot more and you can see the depth and everything. Right? So some of the basics when we're setting up our lights, we don't we're not really concerned as much about real life where the lights would be, unless you wanted to see shadows or something for an architectural basis. Um, but if you're doing it just an interior interior scene or an object or something, you want to make the light so it's going to look good, not necessarily where it's right. Because on this one. These aren't emitting any light. There's no light coming out of those. They're just glowing themselves. The lights are actually shooting along the top, along the bottom, and from the from the from the side and from the other side. And so to, to kind of get what I want to show. So <clears throat> lights that are perpendicular to a surface should brighten up that surface really well. Lights that are at an acute angle to the surface, so if this is the surface, the light's coming this way, that's going to show a lot of texture. Why is this going to show texture? Because it's going to make shadows. Yeah, because we're going to get lots of shadows, right? If there's, any, if there's any variation in the surface, we're going to get shadows from it. If it's going straight at it, no shadows. It's just going to be really bright. So you have to kind of to see what you want. Find up. So like up here, I wanted to be able to see this texture. I wanted to be able to see the lines in the floor. And so I add lights at, at real acute angles to it to cast those shadows. Or else you can't see any of the texture. Okay. So you have to make that mix between making it straight at it so you can see it, making <coughs> it acute so you can see some texture, and also where your camera is matters also. When you do a single frame, it's still easier to do. So right now I want to talk about the basics for single frame. When we're doing animation, we have to take into account more things because we're not going to see it from one side or one point of view. We're going to see it from different points of view. So we're going to have to have a few more lights. The same basic principles apply. Okay, questions? <clears throat> so this is called, called three-point lighting. So usually we have three main lights. We have the key light, what do you think that is? Your main light source. Yeah, your main light source, right? So that's the, the bright one. That's the one that casts your shadows. Usually you'll want one light to have shadows turned on and the rest to have them turned off. Would you ever want more than one light to have shadows turned on? Unless you have two lights in the room. Yeah, if, you, if your scene is set up to have multiple, like a stadium, or even like a photo shoot and you want to have simulate having multiple lights, then yeah, turn on more shadows. But in most cases, you have one shadow. Okay. Then after that, so here's this, the key light. So here's that little picture of a uh, statue. The key light's coming in. And it's doing most of the lighting around of it, right? Can you see any issues with that light? With that lighting? Anything that could be better? Yeah. What? The texture, you know, yeah, that's one, but it just. What could be better about this? It shouldn't be up a little bit higher. So it actually oh, shows more. The angle? Like the yeah, the angle on it. Yeah, it could. Maybe but the subject is too shadow. Yeah, look at this whole side of the. Yeah. The subject can't see any of that, right? Towards the front. 
So if we add a fill light, which is used to, to light the back side of it, now that side that we couldn't see before, now it's lit up really well. Okay. So usually we have a key light to light the main side and cast shadow, the fill light to light the back side. And then a backlight to kind of fill in some, some highlights in the background. So you kind of here and here, just it's going to add a little bit more brightness to those to those points. Okay. So. There's the, the default lighting, what it looked like, the different lights themselves, and then the final. So you can see the difference between this one here and this one once we add in the backlight. Kind of give it a little more pop to the background. So usually three lights is good. What happens when you add, start adding more lights? Yeah, it can get too bright. What else? Yeah, it's going to take a it's going to be more complicated. Take longer to render. So remember, everything we're thinking about is how long is this going to take to render? That should always be in your head. Everything you do, how is this going to affect the rendering time? So if you can get almost the same effect with one light versus three, or between three and five lights, go with the lesser amount. Uh, with animations, since we're going to be moving around, we can't just keep this one here, and then when you look at this light way, have to move the light, that's, unless that's what you want, right? Sometimes that's good to have the light move with you, but usually you'll want the lights to kind of stay still as you're moving. So then you have to have it lit so that you can walk all the way around it, or whatever your field of view is going to be, uh, without being too dark. Okay. Questions? Yes, no. <clears throat> so in Max, we have two different kinds of lights. We have photometric and standard. Which ones do you think are the easiest to use? Standard. Standard. Which ones do you think are more accurate? Photometric. Photometric. Which ones are going to take longer to render? Photometric. So, also you'll see some of these have MR in front of them. MR, MR, MR. What do you think MR stands for? Mental ray. Mental ray. Remember we talked about mental ray earlier? We're using the mental ray renderer, <clears throat> and so mental ray also does more stuff the lights. Um, with mental ray, we can do the final gather, um, and so these lights with MR on them, you have to use mental ray to be able to use those types of lights. If you have one of these set up and then you use the scan line renderer, it's not going to render that light. It also gives you a hint that that's going to take even more time. <clears throat> so let's just go and make something. I'm just going to make a plane real quick. How can I change the size of that, that material? Besides going into the material thing and changing it. The map scaler? Yeah, I could do, or I could do the map scaler and just scale that whole thing, right?
scale that up or down. What's another way I could do it? What's way I can, another way I can scale it or adjust it? So if I wanted to adjust it more than just symmetrical, what if I wanted to adjust this less than that? The UV. Yeah, the UVW mode, right? If I go down to UVW map. Now I can tell that I want that to be two. I want that to be four. I'll get more pieces of it, right? So if I render that now. It's kind of flat, right? Even though the material has a bump map, I can increase that all the way. And I can kind of see a little bit now. You can probably see it on your screens. You can see a little bit more reef in there, but it's still not showing you that much. And that's as high as it's, it goes. Let me turn that back down to 0.5. So now is when I like to use multiple viewports. Whenever I want to add lights, cameras, I like to have multiple viewports. So I'm going to go back over here and go to standard and go to lights. So we've got a couple of different options. So we've got target spot, target, or target spot, target direct, omni, free spot, free direct, and skylight. What's the difference between free and target, do you think? Wider target Probably points out a little bit. No? The, uh, the definition around the actual spot is a lot more. No. Yeah, there is a difference. <laughs> but it's a one click to switch between a free and a target. A free is you're just putting the light in and then you can move and rotate it to have a point somewhere. A target is you have a spot for the light itself and a spot where it's pointing to. And so you move those two independently. So that's the spotlight. So spotlight is a cone. So spotlight does something like that, starts at one point and cones out in, in both, dimensions, both dimensions. A, a direct light, I get, that's where your light is. A direct light, you have your light there, and it spins parallel things out. So that's the difference between a spot and a direct. And you can adjust the angle in the spotlight. Or the, or the diameter of the of the, the direct. You can, you can also tell it to fill outside of that angle. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. But that's the difference between a spot and a direct. I use both. What do you think an omni light is? Shines in all directions. All directions. All directions. Light bulb. Yeah, yeah. So I'll use these most of the time. Omnis sometimes. Usually I want to point the light somewhere. So I'll do that. Um, <coughs> and I don't use sky skylights or, or those. We can see if, what they are if we want to. So, but the way we put it in, if you're using a, a free, if I use this, if I do a free spotlight, when I click to put it in, whichever viewport I'm clicking in, it's going to put on the, the zero plane that viewport. So if I go to here, that's the left view. So it's going to put it on this plane looking that way. See? If I put it on the top, it's going to put it there looking down. If you want to reorganize how your viewports are, I don't know why they do top, front, left. It drives me nuts. 
if you want to do, I usually like to make this my front. And that into this perspective, it's shaded. That back to my right. It's wireframe. That way I'm more like a standard drafting layout. For me that works in my head. I'm not trying to top front. It just, okay, I know this is above that, this is to the side of that. I can work better that way. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. Sometimes I forget to change it. Other times I get, I need to do it. <clears throat> that I can go back to everything. So, goes off. So, So if I use a spotlight, I'm just, I just put it in there looking straight as I put it in. If I use a target, what it's going to do is now I'm going to be able to pick the, the, the light location and the target location. So in this case, I'll, draw, I'll put it in the top view. So I'll put it in here, going that way. And now I can see my other viewports. where that is. And I can see here that that's going this way. If I render that, I don't see anything. Why didn't I see anything there? Did you got to turn your light on? It's on. Oh. It's on. Too close. And I haven't showed you this yet either. When you're ch when you're changing viewports, now that we're using multiple viewports, if you right click in the new viewport, it'll keep your current thing selected. If you left click to change viewports, it'll unselect everything, or it'll select whatever you click on in the new viewport. So if I come over here and I left click, it's gonna. Oh, I'm still in, I'm still in creative light. If I go over here and left click, it'll select that. If I right click, it'll keep it selected. So I usually right click to change viewports just so I don't accidentally click on something and move something or, or do something bad. So I always right click when I change viewports. So let's look at this front view here. Look where the light is, look where my plane is. Right? They're the light is shining down the edge of the front, <coughs> so it can't see anything. So if I want to move it up, I can go here and turn it on, give it a little bit of an angle. Now when I go back here and render it, I should see something. Why can't I? What's the intensity? It should be fine. And if you pick the middle of the light, it'll let you uh, pick, move the whole thing. If I pick on the line, I can move the whole thing. Rendering a different view, <laughs> too. So if I, I render, now you can see some more of that texture showing up.
now you can see the texture a little bit better, right? It's still not showing up really well here in these because it's, oh, it's kind of going that way. Should it move a little more that way? If I adjust it. This is where that adjusting comes in. I'm going to change my angle of my view a little bit, change that. But I'm starting to see it a lot better than I did before. If I pull that straight up from it, it's flat again. go here and look at it. Now I've got move this over so you guys can see it. So I've got lots of options. So I've got the type of light, so I can change it from a spot to a directional to an omni right here. So it really doesn't matter which one I start with. I can change it from targeted to free by unchecking that. I can turn shadows on or off. I can set which type of shadows I want to use. So, um, I have a sample I'll show you. Uh, I need to find it that shows the different types. You might also want to try doing that. Um, try doing it with things that are transparent. Some shadow types, like area shadows, they, they don't, it's still just because I think it's transparent, it'll still cast a shadow. And so you have a window, but then the window will cast a, a full shadow. Other, most of the other ones will go right through it. They also change um, within the shadows how um, the, the fuzziness of the, the, the edges and stuff. So how it calculates it, it it's done in there. If you have the, the, this check mark for use global, it means if you change the setting here, it's going to change it for every other light that has use global checked. If you uncheck change global or use global, it'll only affect this one. Um, you have the intensity, the color, and the attenuation. So the intensity multiplier here, the color of it. So you do want it to be a white light or a colored light. Um, So here's some some real real real, uh, real world light colors, and so it gives you the RGB values that you could plug in to RGB here. To get that, so if you want to simulate real-world lighting, the difference between a fluorescent versus a halogen, you can see that difference. Or if you just want to make a cool blue spotlight. Attenuation? What's attenuation? What's attenuation? What? The frequency of the light. The attenuation is the strength. So, like, you guys in this back can't hear me as loud as the guys in the front, right? Because as sound goes away, it gets softer. Same thing with light. The further it is away, the dimmer it gets. In max, right now I don't have attenuation turned on at all. That means that the light is going to be the same strength forever. If I want the light to dim as it goes away, I need to turn that on. I'm going to turn on use, and I'm going to turn on show also so I can see it. So now. 
you can see in my little preview here, Now I have a couple extra things on my life. I have this area is the near attenuation. Here's the far attenuation. What's the other one? So there's the near. Still light after that. The far is the one that really matters. We're we'll turning the year off, the near off. It's the far that I really care about here. So the start is where it starts to fade, and the and the end is where it's completely black. It's now fading out as it goes. If I have them further apart, now there's more shading as it goes through. If I have them closer together, then that's going to be bright, dark. There's very little. We have the same kind of thing on the sides of it. We have spotlight parameters. We're now we've got the light cone. So we have the angle. See the, the inside cone. If I increase it outside of the, the need to use the keyboard. If I increase this, the hot spot, it'll push the fall off cone out. If I bring this fall off cone down, it'll push the hot spot cone down. But if I have a, a gap between them, I'm getting that, that feathering. I can also make it, instead of being a circle, I can make it a rectangle. So, I just made it a rectangle there. Why would I want to have my life be a rectangle? Yeah, maybe if I wanted to light up. I can also. Look, now what I get, I get a bitmap. So I can fit it to a bitmap. So I could have it fit the aspect ratio of an image. So I could have the light kind of blow up on something to, to simulate a, a projector or something. It's going to be like that. Also, I have right here this overshoot. Now when I render it, look what happens. I left, or look what happened to the hotspot. It's gone, right? Hotspot is gone. Oh, I only have the fall off. And 
So overshoot just means it's going to light up everything. so I can get part of it in and part of it out. So, you can see right here, see how the shadow of this just goes and goes out and stops? And if I adjust that hotspot down, where that shadow stops changes. So with the overshoot on, things that are within the fall off for the field will get shadows. And have shadow only things that are in that field will have shadows cast onto them. Things that are sliding up outside of that, it's just going to light everything evenly. Okay? So, this is like, you know, you really would never, you'd never want this to happen, right? Just part of a shadow to show up. But this thing is really blocking all the shadow out here. You really wouldn't want that to happen. So, if you have overshoot or not, you want to make sure that your fall off is big enough to include all the shadows you want. But why would you want to use that? What would be a good use of that? And then making your your fall off smaller than some objects. Yeah, if something that's gonna be out of your area or the shadow is going to be somewhere you don't want a shadow to be um, and you don't want to have to do the math to figure out where that shadow is by reducing that the, over, the, the fall off you can constrain where it's going to do the math for the shadows because it's calculating everything for your whole scene and it kind of goes through and picks this but then it has to even if there's something up here that it's not in your in your window here but if it's between the light and where you are, it's going to cast a shadow. So if you have something up there that you don't want it to calculate, you can adjust that, that, that size. Okay? Um, you see the shadow parameters, so here's how it calculates the shadows. Uh, if we want atmospheric shadows, so we haven't talked about that yet, but in rendering environments, here for atmospherics we can add fog, cool. and so that means that do you want this fog to affect your light? That's what the, the atmospheric shadows is. Um, also here for this background, since we're here, that's your background color. Or if you go here, you can add a map for your image as your background. So should you put an image as your background? Yes. Depends. If you're doing an animation, 
and you put an image in the background, what's going to happen to your background as you move the camera? It's going to stay flat. It's going to stay the same. So as you walk around, your background is going to stay exactly the same. That's not pretty. Um, maybe I'll, I'll show you an example of that later. Uh, so usually you don't want to do that. If you're going to be doing, you just want to have like a, a blue sky kind of thing, we can change the color. So, but that's just a plain flat color. And so you can do you can do some of your procedural stuff there, but it's not going to move with the animation. So we probably don't want to do that, right? So what do you think? There's some ways we can do a background since we're. What can we do to, to make a background that will move with our animation? Your inside is pretty easy, right? Yeah. You make some walls. How would you do it outside where you don't have walls to put up? Think about it. We'll talk about that next week. <laughs> so if you want to look through that, well, also there's this exposure control. There's a couple different ways that it does to calculate how, how bright the light should be and the, the kind of the coloring of it. If you have more things and you have using the more advanced lighting, it's going to give you some options. Um, we also have the sunlight systems. So if you're doing all stuff outside, you can turn on the sunlight. And that way you can actually tell it where the, you can actually, it'll tell you where the sun will be on a specific day, at a specific place, at a specific time. So if I go to, delete that light, and I go to create systems, sunlight, now I can tell it, get location, and it kind of goes to major things. If I turn off near city, then I can kind of put it exactly where I want. Um, we could just put it in. Let's see, if how, let's see how accurate it is. Put it for today at, at Sacramento. Right now. Fresno. Oh, Fresno. Yeah, I guess that's close enough. Fresno. Forget Fresno. Is, uh, There's no more state college location. Is it 24 hour <laughs> clock or is it a 12 hour clock? Uh, it's a 24. It's February 29th. We're in the negative eight time zone. We should, someone should set that up for 2000 or for uh, 2012. Draw in my see what my orbit thing here. <laughs> it's like black. There is no sun. <laughs> <No. laughs> <coughs> 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 <laughs> no more updates. <laughs> Not available. See here the compass with north, south, east, and west, and then the angle of the sun. So if I change the month, nothing to Well, you have to change the year, so it doesn't reverse. So now if I just render this. Put it on, uh, oh. Oh, uh, don't see it, no. <laughs> <laughs> when you get this 
read what it says. Because <laughs> I turned on the linear exposure control, but with sunlight, that doesn't work. They don't work together. So I need to go in to my exposure control and turn that off. Now it just blew everywhere else. <coughs> so, <coughs> okay, and we also have the radiosity and the final gather. And so what the, these do is that it takes one light and it bounces your light around like it really happens. So if we go to render... go to indirect illumination because right now we have uh, mental ray we have final gather if we switch our renderer to scan line uh, we lose that and somewhere we have the option for the awesome. does is, you can see there's lots of options here. For right now it's just set it draft. If you increase this, if you add more points, right now it's doing zero bounces. So if I told it to one bounce, it would take the light, it would come in, hit a surface, or bounce once, and then light up something else. If I said two ounces, then it would bounce off that wall and light up something else. So the more bounces, the more math it does. That's for everything it hits. Every, every object that it hits is going to bounce off of. Yeah. So right now it's not about, but if it said one, everything that, like from its source, mm -hmm. it would go one step past that. So like if the light was here, and it came down and it hit this, on that spot and this spot, part of the light would bounce that way, and part of the light would bounce this way. And part of it would kind of go that way. But if I had two, it bounce off that, then it bounce off the floor. If I had three, then it bounce off the floor, go up and hit the roof, and bounce off the roof or the ceiling. So changing that can that's where you take a single frame and turn it from a thirty second render to a ten minute render okay. by dropping that to four. We do four of those at the same time. Uh, okay. um, and then also down here, caustics. What do you think caustics is? Anyone know? Have an idea what that is? inside the water. <clears throat> so if you're going to do like an indoor pool and you want to see all the, the light reflections and stuff, that's caustics. And so if you're going to have the light hitting it and you want to see the light bouncing off the ocean, and you want to see the light reflecting the different levels inside the ocean, and then up onto the trees on the shore. Yeah. Um, but that's going to take it from that 10 minute render to like a 20 minute render per, per frame. So the, the more you do, remember the more you do, the more complicated it is. So if you want to start, if you want to get into some of these, um, they have some really good tutorials in Max. If you go to the tutorials, um, there's some really good ones on the, in the indirect lighting. Um, and I would recommend for your animation not to turn on the, the indirects. I do, I do the animation with just the standard lights. If you want to do the indirect lighting, use that for your single frames. Because remember, you're going to do two single frames. So maybe do the whole animation with standard lighting. 
come back to pick two frames that you really like how it lines up and then turn on the indirect lighting and, and do that. That way you get some, a couple frames that look really, really good, but the animation looks pretty good. It didn't take forever. Remember, you're going to have to render about 450 frames at least. That's at 15 frames a second, so that's almost choppy. It's slow. So between 450 and 900 frames is what you're going to have to do for your 30 second animation. And so, yeah. <laughs> think about multiplying how long it takes per frame times that. Long time. Plus, you're going to have some overlap for your different cameras, so it's going to be even more than that. So, <clears throat> any questions? So now you can start adding lights to your to your your scene. Um, you'll notice when you start adding lights, you're probably going to go back and change the materials. Then you're going to change the material, you're going to go back and fix your light. And you're going to do that in that vicious cycle. So, when, when should you stop? Never. When it's perfect. When it's perfect. Stop when it looks pretty good, move on to the next thing. You can always come back to it and, and fuss it some more. But as you saw, I was moving this light, that light back and forth a little bit to, make, to see what changes. I mean, you can spend hours Move it over here, change the intensity here, change this. Um, also, if you have more than one light, if you have more than one light, your key light is going to be the probably at an intensity of one. All your other lights are going to be something below that. So depending on where they are, some might be at like 0.7, some might be at 0.2, some might be at 0.05. So don't just keep their intensities all one or else you're going to blow it out. And also, um, do you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll finish that. Um, let me, one more thing in the, in your environments, this global lighting, that's your ambient. So if you change this ambient from black, that, that'll lighten the whole scene. So if you think the whole thing is just too dark, bring this up from black. That'll, that'll just lighten the whole thing up. As you can see here, now it's a little bit lighter. Right down here, now it's a lot lighter. And you can always go back to rendering, uh, render frame window, and it'll show you the last one that you did. And then to save, and I haven't told you that, how do you save this image? With the little save button. Right? With the little save button, right? Yeah. Save. As a JPEG. Format. What format should you save as? Bitmap. If you save it as a bitmap and try and turn it into me, uh, you're doing it on your blogs, so I don't care. But it takes me more than a few seconds for it to load. I want to leave your blog and not grade it. So, you can do it as a JPEG. That's okay. You can also do it as a PNG. Um, now do it as a JPEG or PNG because those are web form formats also. TIFFs are good, but it's not a web format. <clears throat> um, I prefer PNGs because it's a lossless format. You're not going to lose quality when you save it. Uh -huh. JPEG is a lossy format, so you're, it's going to throw out data when you save the image to compress it. Yeah. Um, so I always do PNGs. I, I'll, I'll throw stuff out at the end when I do the video. But I don't want to lose anything on the way to the video. <clears throat> so I always do a PNG. And then I hit save. Oh, I'll give it a name. I can go to setup. Or I can hit just hit save and this will come up. If I go to setup, it's going to ask me how I want the PNG saved. So, usually a 24-bit is good. We don't need to do 48-bit. It'll kill these computers if you try and do an animation and you have 48-bit selected. <laughs> it will not compile it into a video. It'll be like, ah. Uh. <laughs> no. <laughs> Does it really make that noise? <laughs> well, 
I can imagine it making that noise. It just stops. It's just like, no. You make that noise when it does that. When the computer just stops responding altogether. Um, hey, mine does that all the time. What was alpha? Uh, black and white. It's transparency, right? So anything that was in your background, when you leave it black, that'll be your alpha. It'll be transparent to the layer behind it. So that way, like if you go into uh, Premiere, it 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 can it'll, it'll see that when you import the image sequence, it'll see that that was an alpha, and it'll make that transparent to the layer behind it in Premiere or the video below it. So I always like to leave that on. Just I can always put a black thing behind it or something. Um, interlaced, what's that? Interlaced is the video format that we're using. We're just doing one, one frames interlaced with two lines on each. Yeah, it ta saves them. When the internet was slow, the computers were slow, interlaced. that was a big thing for, for still images, so it, you kind of get part of the image. Yeah, now, it doesn't matter. Progressive. I leave it off. We're gonna redo it later, anyways, when we go into the video. But for your for your progress, re progress renderings, just save it as a 24-bit and upload it. You don't need to optimize it. Then you get all the same glorious benefits you get with a uh, GIF, where it just throws out colors. So questions? Yep. The part on the lighting, I believe there's a part on there where you can actually select like the intensity and the type of light if you want to do like fluorescent, isn't there? Yeah, that's in the color. No, it's not on the color. It was actually showing. I found a spot where it's actually. Uh, where is it? You were probably showed, thinking like, of tungsten? the photometrics. Oh, okay, maybe that's where it is. Because photometrics, uh, when you yeah, put it in, what I was playing with. Yep. There's, there it is. It's got all the, the presets for the color. So when you use a standard light, you have to go find the RGB value. You use the photometrics that has this because it's not just taking the color, uh, but now you can also put in the, your loop, your intensity, not just in a multiplier of one or whatever. Now you can actually tell it lux, so or or lumens. So lights have lumens, right? Lights are lumens. Lux is a measure of light intensity at a certain distance, and then multipliers, and so there's all kind of the same kind of stuff, but a lot more to it. I can pick a template here, so there's a 80 watt halogen bulb, and it presets everything. So pick what you want, experiment with some different things. <coughs> try it out, see what the rendering is like with the photometric versus a standard. Um, try it out. Try them, see what happens, try different shadow types. See what you like for what you want to get out of your image. Okay. Questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Hey, can we, uh, like, so you want us to do a background too, correct? Yeah. So can we do like a do like a, uh, like a big wall and put a big picture on each side. So, Robert just hit the, the nail that I told you to think about for next time. So instead of having, because the outside you're not going to have straight walls, you can have a curved wall around it, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can have a dome over it. Think Truman Show. Yep. Put, it, put a big dome on it. Put a, put a sky material on that whether it's an image or a procedural map that you put on there that has kind of a, a gradient with some, because a, a gradient from like a, a dark blue at the top to a light blue or whatever it's supposed to be outside, uh, red to blue, um, then you can put some, some turbulence in it with some streaks, you can do some bands of white with some turbulence in them, or do the some volumetric fog, or even do some kind of a, a box up in the air with some transparency to it that makes it look like a cloud, right? Add some noise to it, stretch it out, get some transparency, make it white, and now you've got a cloud in the sky. That actually, when you move it, it'll 
move a little bit, but not like staying still. So <clears throat> think about different ways you can make your environment besides just black. Even if you're in space, you're not going to have just black. You're going to have stars. So you need, you need to figure out a way to put the stars in there. Okay? Black hole. Questions? Black hole.